In this next section of the chapter on chemistry, we'll be examining the biological macromolecules. These are the compounds of life, and they fall under the study of biochemistry. It's the study of compounds and reactions of all living systems. There are four basic kinds of macromolecules. We'll begin by examining the carbohydrates, then the lipids, followed by proteins and nucleic acids. All macromolecules, except for the lipids, are formed by polymerization. That is, they are multi-unit molecules called polymers. The word mer means unit, poly meaning many units, mono meaning one unit. So these macromolecules, except for the lipids, are formed by many units linked together to form polymers. We'll examine those here in more detail shortly. We'll begin by looking at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates include sugars and polysaccharides. Sugars can be the monomers and polysaccharides, meaning many saccharides linked together. They're represented by the formula CH2O to the nth, meaning n is the number of repeats. The sugar fitting this formula that you're most familiar with already is C6H12O6. So polysaccharides then are built from monomers repeating monosaccharides. Now in each of the polymer classes of macromolecules, there are three things that you should consider. What is the polymer called? What is the monomer called? And then what's the linkage that holds them together? So in this case, we have polysaccharides, which is the polymer version. The monomer is the monosaccharide. Many monosaccharides link together to form a polysaccharide. You can see in the diagram below, here's a monosaccharide. And if we put two of them together, it's called a disaccharide. And if we link many, many of them together, we have a polysaccharide, anything more than two. Generally, carbohydrates are used for the storage of energy or for structure. Cellulose is a structural carbohydrate. That's the structural component of plants. Or in potatoes, you might see starch, which is used for energy storage. In humans, we'll see glycogen which is a polysaccharide used for energy storage in our muscle cells. So here's the terminology that I just discussed. We've got a variety of configurations. The bottom line is a sugar is a saccharide. This is a simple carbohydrate and it has a sweet taste. We have taken a look at monosaccharides, disaccharides, and also polysaccharides. Now taking a closer look at monosaccharides and disaccharides, they're specified by combining a prefix that describes the characteristic of the sugar with the suffix os. So hexoses are six carbon sugars, pentoses are five carbon sugars, and we might see something like fructose or sucrose or galactose. Fructose is a sugar that we find in fruit. Again, there are many functions of polysaccharides. First, in structural support and protection, as we saw with cellulose in plants. This same cellulose also builds up the structure of a tree, which eventually we might cut down and slice up into very small pieces, like the paper that you're writing on today. Some polysaccharides serve as nutrient and energy stores, as exhibited by starch and glycogen. Some important polysaccharides that we might see this semester include agar, which is a medium on which we'll be growing some of our bacterial cultures. Chitin, which is a structural polysaccharide that we see in crab and lobster and insect shells. As well as lipopolysaccharide, which is a molecule that's found in the wall of gram-negative bacteria. It's a complex of lipid and polysaccharide, and it's responsible for the symptoms we see, such as fever and shock. We'll be examining lipopolysaccharide in much more detail later in the semester. The glycocalyx of any cell functions in attachment to other cells or is a site for receptors or surface molecules that receive external stimuli. The glycocalyx can also act as binding sites. And again, we've already examined glycogen as starch, as important polysaccharides in energy storage. So let's take a moment to quickly review what the monomer is of a polysaccharide. The monomer is a monosaccharide. The polymer is a polysaccharide. And the monomers are held together to form a polymer 
by bonds, they are covalent bonds, called glycosidic linkages. Now let's take a quick review of a large category of macromolecules called lipids. This lipid category is a non-polymer category. That means that it's not composed of repeating subunits of the same monomers. It's made up of several different types of monomers. Lipids include fats, phospholipids, and waxes. The lipids are a variety of substance that are not soluble in polar substances. They'll dissolve, therefore, in nonpolar solvents. The biologically important kinds of lipids that we'll take a look into today are the triglycerides, the phospholipids, and the sterols. Let's begin with triglycerides. Triglycerides are our fats and oils. They're the primary energy storage molecule that we have. A triglyceride is composed of one glycerol and three fatty acid molecules. Sometimes the fatty acids are saturated and sometimes they're not. Hence the idea of saturated versus unsaturated fats. Here we can see a saturated fatty acid. That is, each carbon is saturated with hydrogens. It has as many hydrogens as it can possibly carry. On the other hand, you can see here linoleic acid is an unsaturated fatty acid. There are double bonds between some of these carbons instead of simply adding additional hydrogens in these spots. Because of this formation, the chains will become kinky, as you can see over here on the right. That is, they bent. So saturated fats, the triglyceride tails, stay very parallel, and thus they stick together and form a solid at room temperature. However, unsaturated fatty acids have kinky tails, and thus they don't form a solid at liquid temperature because these tails don't stack up on each other as nicely as a saturated fatty acid. Now, I always like to bring this up. Consider for a moment what a hydrogenated oil really is. Well, synthetically, they've added hydrogens back into these places in order to make this oil solid at room temperature. So really, you have to ask yourself, could margarine possibly be better for you than real butter? after they've synthetically added back those hydrogens? Hmm. Somehow I think not. Now, another class of lipids that we're very familiar with from general biology would be phospholipids, as phospholipids make up the membranes of all living organisms. Phospholipids are amphipathic molecules. Now that's kind of a big crazy word. What does amphipathic mean? Well, amphipathic means that it is both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. And in the case of a phospholipid, you'll remember this phosphate head is polar, whereas the tails are nonpolar. In other words, the phosphate head is hydrophilic and the tails are fatty acid tails. They're hydrophobic. So phospholipids share a commonality in structure with a triglyceride because they do have these fatty acid tails. You'll recall from general biology that phospholipids associate themselves spontaneously into spheres with their hydrophilic heads pointed out and the hydrophobic tails hiding on the inside away from the water in the center of this micelle. We can also cause these phospholipids to associate into a bilayer. This phospholipid bilayer that you see here is the basis of cell membranes. We'll look into those shortly. Another type of lipid are the sterols. These are important because they involve things like cholesterol, and cholesterol is a precursor to all of our reproductive hormones. Sterols have a multi-ring structure that you can see exhibited here. Cholesterols reinforce the structure of the cell membrane in animal cells and in an unusual group of cell wall deficient bacteria called the mycoplasmas. The cell membranes of fungi also contain a sterol that's called ergosterol. Bile acids and many hormones are also in the class of sterols. Finally, in this class of macromolecules, we'll see waxes. 
Chemically, wax is an ester and it's formed between a long chain alcohol and a saturated fatty acid. This results in a material that's typically pliable and soft when warm, but hard and water resistant when cold. Paraffin's a great example of one of the waxes. We'll see it among living things in their fur, in their feathers, on the skins of fruits, covering leaves, on human skin, and insect exoskeletons. These things are naturally waterproof with a coating of wax. Also, bacteria that cause tuberculosis and leprosy produce a wax that repels ordinary laboratory stains and contributes to their pathogenicity. Now let's take a quick concept check. What's the main function of a triglyceride? Is it cell structure, membrane structure, energy storage, or does it have enzyme activity? As we whiz through a review of macromolecules, we'll now take a look into proteins. Proteins are the molecules that really shape life. They either are structure or they're actually active in doing things. They're the predominant organic molecules. Their building blocks or monomers are amino acids. The polymer is a polypeptide. So note that down. Our first class, we had our carbohydrates, monosaccharides, polysaccharides, and the monosaccharides is bonded to each other by glycosidic linkages. Here, the monomers are amino acids. The polymers are polypeptides, and they're held together by peptide linkages, also a covalent bond. There are 20 different naturally occurring forms of amino acids. Here are a few examples over here on the right side. The basic skeleton of an amino acid consists of a central carbon, an amino group, and a carboxyl group, as well as a single hydrogen atom, and this R group. The R group is what makes one amino acid distinctly different from another. Other than the R group, you'll notice they all have the same structure. Central carbon, amino group, carboxyl group, single hydrogen ion, and a distinct R group. The R group could be small or large. As simple as a single hydrogen that you see here in alanine to much more complex like you see here in tyrosine. Again, these individual amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds. The peptide bond forms between the amino group of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of another amino acid by dehydration synthesis, and thus we have a covalent bond. Now, each of these 20 different types of amino acid have different characteristics in their R groups. Some of them are not polar, some of them are polar, and some of them are even charged. So this means they could either be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Proteins can be structural, such as we see in components of the cytoskeleton over here. Microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. They could be mechanical, like dyanine. Here's a dyanine motor. Dyanine motors essentially run things along the cytoskeletal elements and inside the cell in order to get things from place to place. Another place that we'll see proteins is as biological catalysts or enzymes. They basically run everything in our body as well as in all the microbes we'll be studying this semester. Remember, DNA codes for proteins. Thus, proteins are everything. Let's look a little bit deeper into the structure and diversity of proteins. You'll probably recall there were four levels of structure, the primary structure simply being the amino acid sequence or the polypeptide sequence, shown up here in part A of this figure. The secondary structure is a localized modular structure that forms things like beta pleated sheets and alpha helices on the amino acid sequence. So literally, this piece in A will coil and fold to form these structures that we see in the secondary structure. In tertiary structure, we start seeing a more three-dimensional shape of a protein as the amino acid sequence that has its beta pleated sheets and alpha helices 
further it coils and forms its shape. Now this tertiary structure form will happen due to interactions between different amino acids in the chain. For example, those amino acids that are hydrophobic or uncharged may all end up in the center of the protein, protected from the aqueous surround. Finally, we look at quaternary structure. Now, not every protein has quaternary structure, but many do. All of them have tertiary structure, and sometimes many polypeptide chains with their own tertiary structure come together to form quaternary structure, meaning many tertiary forms stick together, that's where we get our quaternary structure. Each different type of protein will develop a very unique shape, so it can interact only with the molecules that fit its particular surface features. For the example we might use here enzymes, enzymes interact with their substrates very specifically. The enzyme that picks up cholesterol, for example, in order to turn it into one of its steroid hormone forms is very specific to cholesterol and releases only that particular type of hormone. Another example are antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that bind specifically to antigens that they're designed to bind to. The functional three-dimensional form of a protein we consider to be its native state. Its native state as in the state that it exists in when it's doing its job. When a protein has been disrupted, as in this three-dimensional structure has been destroyed, we call it denatured. So denatured versus native state. Now heat and pH are two situations where we can really denature a protein's native state. Finally, we'll take a look at nucleic acids. The nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. Thus, they're analogous to a cell computer and all the programs that run it. DNA is specially coded. DNA is the genetic program, and it transfers this program to RNA. RNA will then carry the message to ribosomes in order to manufacture proteins. Both DNA and RNA are polymers of repeating units called nucleotides. So a nucleic acid is the polymer that's composed of monomers called nucleotides that are held together by phosphodiester bonds. Let's take a quick look at nucleotides before we go any further. Nucleotides are composed of three smaller units. First, at its center, we have a pentose sugar, also a phosphate group, and thirdly, a nitrogenous base. Now, I consider this the order of ends because we have three N words in here. We've got nitrogenous base, we've got nucleotide, and we've got nucleic acid. So in order to keep these in order, let's consider the order of ends. Nucleic acids are bigger than nucleotides. They're composed of nucleotides. And nitrogenous bases are smaller further. Thus, we have an order of magnitude associated with these three N words, larger, smaller, and smaller so. This helps me keep track. Now, this nitrogenous base can be one of two forms. It can either be a purine, which is made of two rings, or a pyrimidine, which is made of one ring. There are two types of purine that is adenine and guanine, and two types of pyrimidines, which are thymine and cytosine, as well as uracil that we'll see in RNA. Now, how do you keep these straight? Here's a couple of rules. We use the rule of Y. Pyrimidines, which has a Y in it, are thymine, which has a Y, cytosine, which has a Y, and then uracil replaces thymine when we come to RNA. The purines don't have any Ys. Also, purines is a small word and pyrimidines is a larger word. So purines have the opposite. They have a large structure, the two ring structure. And pyrimidines, being a bigger word, has a smaller structure. It may be silly, but that's just how I keep track of it.
Now, in one of the discoveries of DNA structure, there was a man named Chargraff who came up with some rules that said the proportion of A is equal to the proportion of T in any DNA molecule. Thus, he was able to assume that A's and T's were paired together and G's and C's were paired together. So that is, we have one large ring structure, the two ring structure, paired with one smaller ring structure. Now this is important because if we had two two ring structures, the bases would be wider and thus that rung of the ladder, the DNA ladder, would be much wider than if it just had two purines and it would be too narrow. So having one of each makes each of the steps equal in width. So DNA has a much more uniform structure. So what does DNA do? We know that it's the genetic material. And because it's the genetic material, it encodes all the information of the cell. Either it's encoding for structural proteins that give something shape and form, or it's encoding for proteins that do things like enzymes. The four monomers are the nucleotides. Again, nucleotides are the monomers. Nucleic acids are the polymers. There are four different possibilities for monomers in DNA. And DNA is a double-stranded helix. Here you can see Chargraff's rules at play, where T, a single ring structure, and A, a double ring structure, or purine, are paired together. So we have alternating phosphate and sugar backbones with nucleotides facing towards the center. So it looks much like a staircase. RNA, in contrast, consists of a long, single strand of nucleotides. So it's sort of like half the ladder. It contains ribose instead of deoxyribose and uracil instead of thymine. There are several functional types of RNA that are formed from using a DNA template. First of all, the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a copy of the gene that provides the order and type of amino acids that should go into a protein. The messenger RNA is moving from the nucleus, carrying the message of the DNA, to the ribosome where the protein will be manufactured. Then there's transfer RNA, or tRNA. It delivers the correct amino acids to the ribosome so that it can build a good solid protein. And finally, ribosomal RNA is a major component of the ribosomes. You'll also see small nuclear RNA. Small nuclear RNA has a smaller role, but a very important role in gene expression. You may recall from general biology its role in snipping out the introns, the inactive portions of DNA. Another very important nucleic acid we need to consider is ATP. ATP, you'll be familiar, is the energy molecule of cells, adenosine triphosphate. It's very similar to the structure of a nucleotide. You'll see here it's composed of a pentose sugar and an adenine to form adenosine. And it's linked onto three phosphates instead of one. These three phosphates make this molecule a very high energy compound and it gives off energy when the phosphate bonds are broken. So ATP then can both release and be used to store energy to fuel our chemical reactions. I think of it as the gas of the cell. So we dig out fossil fuels from the earth and we refine them in order to make gasoline. ATP we consume all sorts of food and we refine it to form ATP so that we can run all the processes of our cells. ATP is used by all living things, so that includes all of the micro forms of life that we're going to examine this semester. So we'll have a constant conversion of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, chopping off a phosphate and then forming ADP, which is a lower energy molecule. Then when we add on another phosphate, it becomes ATP again and is high energy. It takes energy from the food that we consume in order to build ATP from ADP. And it releases energy to fuel our cellular processes when we cut off one of the phosphates to reform ADP. This slide summarizes that information. These high energy bonds of breaking ADP 
ATP into ADP and an inorganic phosphate releases 32 kilojoules of energy. Finally, before we come to the end of this chapter, let's take a moment to look at how chemicals bring cells to life. Cells are the fundamental unit of life. They can be anywhere from spherical to, to polygonal, cubical or cylindrical. They have a cytoplasmic membrane and chromosomes that are made of DNA. They have ribosomes that allow for protein synthesis and they reproduce to form progeny cells or daughter cells. They obtain energy by assimilating it from their environment, either in the form of food from the sun or other chemical mechanisms. There are two basic types of cells, eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Now the eukaryotic cells are the ones we're probably most familiar with. They're the cells that compose our own bodies. So they're in animals, plants, as well as fungi and some proteins. Proteins are mostly single cellular organisms that are eukaryotic cells. They're much more complex cells because they have a nucleus and cellular organelles. And they tend to be on the order of 10 times larger than our prokaryotic cells. Karya means nucleus. So prokaryotic means before the nucleus was formed. So prokaryotic cells have no nucleus, nor do they have any other organelles. They tend to be on the order of 10 times smaller. And we'll see the main players in this semester's course, bacteria and archaea, are prokaryotic cells. Now we'll also be considering viruses in this semester. You'll have to keep in mind that viruses are neither eukaryotic nor prokaryotic because they don't have any of the characteristics of cells themselves. They're simply protein and DNA. And there's a lot of debate to whether they actually fill the specifications of living or non-living. Let's have a quick concept check before we close up this chapter. What level of protein structure are alpha helices and beta pleated sheets formed? Hmm. Well, primary structure, what was that? That was the amino acid sequence, so we can take that off the list. Secondary structure, I'm not really sure. Quaternary structure was when all these different tertiary structures came together. Some proteins have it, some don't, so we'll cross that off the list. Tertiary was the three-dimensional folding of an amino acid chain that already had some other sorts of structures. And secondary structure was when the amino acid chain formed its first coils and pleats. Those were the beta pleated sheets and alpha helices. So I'm going to go with secondary structure. So that concludes our review of chemistry. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, either by email, by text message, by cell phone, or through the discussion board. I'll look forward to hearing from you.